Ontario, under the leadership of a progressive conservative government, is pushing forward one of the most destructive and frankly racist pieces of legislation in Canadian history slipped through under the guise of anti-racism. I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into the program. So today I want to get into Bill 67 in Ontario. It is an act to amend acts with respect to racial equity. And I've been hearing a lot of feedback from viewers, from True North supporters who say that they want us to cover this. This is an incredibly important bill. Uh, Jordan Peterson had a podcast on the topic called Kill Bill 67. He was joined by Bruce Party, David Haskell, professor over at Laurier, and joined by my guest today, Barbara Kay. Barbara Kay is a columnist for the Post Millennial, for the Epoch Times. She writes for the Western Standard Online, and she's one of the most well-known journalists and columnists in Canada. Barbara, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us. It's great to be here, Candice. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, I mean, I I listened to your podcast with Jordan Peterson and and digging into so many of the problematic elements of this bill. I think perhaps the worst one of all is that it was proposed by an NDP MPP in Ontario, which should have been a big red flag to conservatives. I'm not really sure how it went from being a private member's bill from an opposition left-wing NDP member to being a bill from the government. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could help us wrap our heads around why this bill is being presented in Ontario under a conservative government. Well, the only explanation I can think of is that like so many other politicians in so many other places, uh, the bill, uh, the way it was framed, uh, it, it sounds like a good thing because it's about teaching students how to fight racism. And uh, this, this always sounds very good. Uh, the, the key word that should have been a tip off was the word equity, uh, which appears 54 times in this bill. And the word equality does not even appear once. And this is the key uh, thing that people have to grasp is that when you see the word equity, it has nothing to do with equality. Um, It has to do with uh, a philosophy or an ideology in which uh, racism is understood to be the uh, default um, kind of uh, environment in which both whites and people of color live. People of color are always racialized uh, and whites who have inherent privilege are the vectors for that racism. But that's not what I think uh, the government understood it to be. I think they understood it simply as a means of fighting racism. Um, you know, one of the things that startled me the most was that um, Rick Nichols, who was kicked out of the Conservative Party in Ontario for uh, being against vaccine mandates, and he joined the Ontario Party. He's sitting for the Ontario Party. Uh, and he, of all people, should know uh, the difference as a true conservative, should know the difference. He admitted to his party, he voted for it. He said, I was fooled. I thought, what? It's anti racism. He did not know the difference between the word equity and equality or what it stands for. Well, it's funny that you mentioned Rick, so I was going to bring him up uh, later. That, that's actually the first time I heard about this bill because I, I usually focus on federal politics, feder- I focus on Justin Trudeau and, and everything happening over in Ukraine. And then a uh, guest op-ed landed on my desk uh, from MPP Rick Nichols. So we we published that here at True North. He wrote, voting for critical race theory bill was a mistake. And he he laid out his thinking. He said, on Thursday, I made a significant unintentional error when I voted for Ontario, I voted in the Ontario legislature for Bill 67, the equity Racial Equity in Education System Act. And then he, he went on to explain exactly what you just said, that he didn't quite read it carefully enough, or he understood equity to mean equality. Now he realizes it's different. And he, he sort of talked about the two main thinkers behind critical race theory, which we talk about a lot on the show here, because it's, it's a, such a concern. Uh, but I guess that uh, the, the thinking isn't prevalent yet amongst conservatives if they if they didn't know uh, the difference because a lot of the words to be frank uh, Barbara that you know they sound good like everyone wants to be anti-racist everybody wants to fight back against true racism 
Uh, but it seems that the problem with this bill is that that's not what it does. Uh, I, I want to go through some of the sort of substance of the bill so that we can all wrap our heads around what is going on here. And uh, basically, uh, they because basically what they want to do is create these kind of re-education training camps for teachers, uh, compelling them and requiring them uh, to be steeped in this leftist ideology. So there's a professional development program on anti-racism, which would establish and provide annual professional development programs to educate teachers and other staff of the board about promoting racial equity and developing the necessary tools to address racism. Uh, racial disturbances. So they're going to introduce fines of up to $200 uh, for anyone who uh, is, is disrupts or attempts to disrupt the proceedings of a school or class through the use of race, racist language and engaging in racial in racist activities, which again sounds good, but uh, the definitions are, are what is important. Um, Anti-racism competency, so teachers will be uh, appraised, or performance pr pr uh, appraisal will include uh, competencies related to a teacher's anti-racism awareness and the teacher's efforts to promote racial equity. Um, there's a, a board racial equity plan. Every board shall establish a ra racial equity plan for the schools of the board and require its schools to implement the plan. I could go on and on. There's about 10 of these or more. Um, and, and so the idea is really to just steep these schools in this sort of perverse leftist ideology. So maybe you can help us really understand a bit better what this what this ideology seeks to accomplish. Well, the it, what it seeks to accomplish is is the idea that uh, uh, that there is a power structure uh, that has to be disrupted, to be broken down, to be this is this is revolu It's a revolutionary kind of ideology in the sense that uh, they think our present society um, is is a, a very bad one because it's it's established on uh, principles that uh, are uh, white that that are based in white uh, history and white power structures, the enlightenment values of um, evidence-based knowledge and due process. And a lot, of the, a lot of the liberal principles that we take for granted are considered to be wrong because they are uh, modern uh, ideas rather than postmodern ideas. You know, I don't. I don't think this is the time to. I mean, I, and I can't even explain it as well as people who really studied this for a very long time. And I would encourage people to go to James Lindsay's website, newdiscourses.com, if you want to know everything there is to know about critical race theory and how it's implemented in schools and other institutions. It's in all institutions now. People are forced to take a courses in which they admit their white privilege. They admit that they have um, un they have power because they are white. Whiteness is uh, considered a kind of original sin. Um, in the bill, which you read parts of, two things should jump out. One, the failure to define anything. It's all very vague. Uh, what is a disturbance? Uh, they say that racism is a um, uh, social, socially constructed. It's, it's socially constructed. What does that mean, socially constructed? And it can be experienced consciously or subconsciously. Well, when you start saying that people's innermost thoughts, that they aren't even aware of themselves, are subject to investigation and punishment, um, who decides on whether you're a racist or not? Well, the person who says they feel offended by some remark you've made. You notice, too, that there's one group that's missing. They say this, this bill is going to combat, uh, it's, it's going to be anti-racism, anti-Islamophobia, anti-this, anti-that. The one group that is anti-Asianism, um, but anti-Caucasianism, that's not in there because that is whites are going to, whiteness is the one evil that everybody is encouraged to, um, uh, to be hostile to because it's the root of why uh, racialized people are disadvantaged in society. That's the idea. So if the outcomes of all these different races uh, are not exactly the same or better than um, uh, than white people's outcomes. Then the problem is racism, and that's the only problem. It, it, it's a really terrible ideology, right? Yeah, and, and just to go back to the idea that that MP Nichols, MPP Nichols voted for it, it's like 
exactly, you read these definitions and I'll just read them here because I have them right in front of me. So they describe anti-racism, which means the policy of opposing racism, including anti-indigenous racism, anti-black racism, anti-Asian racism, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia. And then it describes racism. It means the use of socially constructed ideas of race to justify or support, whether consciously or subconsciously, the notion that one race is superior to another. So, so it, it puts right in there this idea that race is socially constructed. Um, but then in the anti-racism definition, it specifically lists all these races. So it's like, well, wait a minute, is, is, is race socially constructed? And then, and then to a broader point, uh, Barbara, Canada has always been a pluralistic diverse country. It was never one group of people that, that that settled and had the country, right? It was always a mix of First Nations, French, English, and in English, it was Scottish, uh, English, Irish. Um, and, and then and then obviously in the in the in the 20th century, we had huge influx of immigrants from all over the world. There are so many different cultures that live harmoniously side by side in Canada, even just taking all of the different European groups that settled in Canada and putting this clunky title uh, whiteness on them, it, it misses so much because there's there's a big difference between someone who just moved here uh, from Eastern Europe like yesterday and hasn't acclimatized to Canada yet, hasn't integrated, um, and someone who might be of uh, you know Chinese origin but their family came over four or five generations ago and they and they've accomp- accustomed to Canada, they've established themselves here. Like they, they, there's so much that's missing from this very simplistic group mentality that is placed on to Canada. I, I wonder if you could comment on. Yes, because the the idea that you're not an individual, you know, Martin Luther King pretty well said it all for all time. I'm not interested in the color of your skin. I'm interested in the content of your character. And at at that time, he expressed the liberal, the classic liberal, what we now call conservative, because we conservatives are basically classic liberals. And that should have defined for all time uh, what should be our ideal, to judge people by their individual characteristics and not by the, but uh, he's he's old school, that is so out. The opposite is true now. You are, you are a representative of your identity. And if you don't have the correct thoughts that go along with your identity, then you lose that uh, affiliation. It's kind of interesting that, you know, blacks are all supposed to feel racialized, but if they insist that they don't and that they've succeeded very well in our society, because of our liberal principles, then they they suddenly lose their blackness, or they have false consciousness, or they've been uh, they have been uh, brainwashed by uh, you know whites to uh, to be a uh, to carry water for whiteness. So uh, this this is a very Marxist idea that you are a member of the ownership class or the working class, or it's just it's 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 it, it, they've turned the economic paradigm into a cultural paradigm. So uh, now it's, uh, you are a function, you function according to your group. That's such a pernicious ideology because it's very patronizing and infantilizing to uh, people of color, assuming that they can never get ahead unless there's huge state interference uh, in order to give them a special leg up. And uh, it's also hugely insulting to people of color like uh, South Asians and Asians, other Asians who have done extremely well uh, because uh, they have taken advantage of the opportunities that our country, our democracies give uh, everyone. And they have applied uh, their own work ethic and their ambitions and you know they're not interested in microaggressions or anything else. And they've gotten ahead and they are, have succeeded actually statistically better than uh, the average white person. And they too are problematic. So they are totally, you know, they're considered to be white adjacent or they have other explanations. The point is that students are going to be punished for having thoughts that normally we would consider normal in a society that values critical thinking. And they will not be allowed to say them. This word disturbances or disruptions it's not defined, is it? But I can tell you what it will be. It will be, it will be somebody who will say in a classroom, "Well, I don't really believe that 
uh, you know, a man can actually become a woman. I mean, I guess a man could identify as a woman, but he can't really become a woman. That will be considered a disturbance and, and he will be punished. Or I don't believe that the residential schools were really what you would call a genocide. That will be considered a disturbance. You know, it, we can go on and on. Um, it's, it's, it's just so pernicious and it will, it will, it will actually smother uh, a student's um, inclination, never mind ability. You can't develop a skill unless you exercise it. But if you've, if it's been smothered, if then you will never even know what that skill is. You will never even, you'll stop wanting it. You'll stop, you'll stop, you know, if you don't allow a child to throw a ball between the ages of five and eight, that child will never be able to develop a really good throwing arm. Uh, and that's what they're doing to these children, or they're, they would, they are going to do if this bill passes. So I, I'm just, um, it's one of the most disturbing um, bills I've ever seen. And, and uh, I know Jordan Peterson uh, felt exactly the same way. And that's why he organized that podcast very quickly. Uh, and it went on and it, it sort of, that bill was introduced under the radar. Uh, and as you say, from a radical leftist, who was known at Laurier University for being radical, even by Laurier's far leftist uh, uh, attitudes towards equity, diversity, and inclusion, and all the rest. And nobody knows that better than Lindsay Shepard, <laughs> you know, who who uh, was the uh, the first chief. victim. Yes, she was, and she was the victim of of the person who introduced the Bill sixty seven. The she was the victim of her policy, her policy on sexual violence, sexual violence. Um, and it was considered then radical even by Laurier standards. Uh, so if the people of Ontario, if the parents of Ontario don't wake up and let their MPPs know and let Doug Ford know and let, I don't know what happened to his minister of education, Stephen Lecce, who, um, and Sam Oosterhoff, who's supposed to be that's right. Isn't he's supposed to be like a true, true blue conservative. He endorsed this bill. What? Maybe you could get him on your show and ask yeah. him, ask him what the hell he was thinking. Well, that's a great, that's a great suggestion because he was sort of a young, outspoken MPP. Yeah. I think he was elected when he was still a teenager, if I yes, remember exactly. correctly. And part of the reason that the progressive conservatives and Doug Ford became so popular and got frank, frankly got elected was because they were pushing back against the former premier of Ontario, Kathleen Wynne and her pernicious uh, sex ed program. And, and this government was supposed to be the ones that were uh, pushing back against radical leftism in our education system. So it, it, it really is remarkable that they would you know, champion this this NDP bill, and and especially with the background uh, that you're describing with with Lindsay Shepard and that whole ordeal, which Lindsay wrote a great book about for for us here at True North um, called Diversity and Exclusion. I loved it. Great book. She recounts every single thing that happened, and it's just absolutely wild. The ideology, the bullying, uh, the, the way that she was treated. Barbara, I'm wondering, because what we've seen in recent years in the United States where, you know, basically this, this ideology has just been wholesale imported into Canada. It's an American ideology addressing American issues. Uh, I, I mentioned that uh, Rick Nichols' op-ed that he wrote for us, he, 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 he looked at the two sort of founding thinkers, uh, Robin D'Angelo, uh, who wrote a book called White Fragility, and then Abram X. Kendi, who wrote a book called How to Be an Anti-Racist. And I know he also has a children's book uh, called Anti-Racist Baby, uh, which I will not be reading <laughs> to my uh, little kids. But uh, Ibram X. Kennedy wrote that the only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. So he's outright calling for discrimination against uh, white people. Anyway, in, in the U.S., you know, we saw a uh, conservative Republican governor get elected in Virginia, which is usually a pretty solid blue state. Uh, we've seen uh, many states, including Montana, Florida, all these states pushing forward bills to prevent and stop the teaching of this this really uh, racist theory in their schools. How, how come parents in Canada haven't had the same kind of uh, uprising and the same kind of outrage over uh, the fundamental 
racist principles being taught in schools, like you said, both really harmful to young um, children of color who come from backgrounds where they're now told by the school that you can't succeed because the system is against you. No matter what you do, uh, you'll always be held back. And to young white students saying that there's something inherently wrong with you because of your skin color. I mean, I can't think of a worse way to divide and, and, and teach kids. Why isn't there more pushback from, from parents in this country? You're right, it is actually teaching hatred between groups, uh, not just divisive. It's it's actually encouraging uh, perpetual hate on one side and resentment and perpetual guilt and resentment on the other side. Uh, why? Well, Canadians uh, seem to be addicted to niceness and they've interpreted uh, this movement as a way to be nice to racialized people. Uh, they've drunk the Kool-Aid. Um, I mean, I, 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 I'm sorry to keep harping on Rick Nichols, but it's a perfect symbol of if he can be hoodwinked, if he can be gaslighted, and they're so clever, these words are so, they're so adorable. Equity, it sounds so great. Diversity, inclusion, these are all weasel words. They all mean the opposite of what they sound like they mean. Equity is the opposite of equality. Diversity uh, is, is the opposite of diversity of opinion. It's, it's actually uh, the kiss of death to critical thinking. And inclusion means exclusion for uh, people who, who aren't uh, intersectionally um, you know, on the list of official victimhood. Uh, so they're all weasel words and they're all very, very illiberal, very anti-classic liberalism, but Canadians, I'm sorry to say, are easily hoodwinked. They are, they have a tendency to, uh, they, this, this addiction to niceness turns them into sheeple. Um, and, um, I, I, it's sad to say, oh, you deserve what you get. But the trouble is that a lot of people that don't deserve it are swept along because there isn't a critical mass of, of uh, parents. Parents who have, who, well, I shouldn't say not everybody because some people are uniting under FAIR, uh, this organization that shows parents how to organize and how to make their voices heard. So forgive me, I, I don't mean to be criticizing you. You're doing a great job, but there's not enough of you. Um, so I'm sorry to use this as a pulpit but I'm, I'm so agitated by this bill and so so annoyed at, at Canadians who are so trusting of the state that they actually, uh, it does this, that this does not arouse their curiosity, let alone um, their, their alarm. And I guess that's my message today. Well, it, it's sort of like, you know, we, we uh, go along to get along until we hit, reach a point where we can't go along anymore. And I think we, we recently saw that with the trucker convoy, at least initially, you know, for two long years, we went along with these draconian, uh, contradictory, hypocritical policies that didn't really make any sense. But we had this sort of like co collective idea that we were all in it together and we were going to do what was necessary. Yeah, agree. but look at look at the punishment that rained down on on the Freedom Convoy and is still... Uh, we're still uh, seeing the fallout from that. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's great that people did, you know, kind of kick back. But then what was the message that a lot of people are, are taking from the Freedom Convoy? Well, if you do that, you're going to get uh, punished with an act, the Emergencies Act, the, I mean, your bank account frozen. How many people how many people took courage from the Freedom Convoy and how many people took the message, ooh, uh, <laughs> I guess I don't want to be part of a movement that, um, you know, uh, that, that, that is very public about demanding my rights because my rights could be taken away. Uh, and I think that's unfortunately the message that a lot of Canadians took from the convoy. I, I think you're right. And I think that was the purpose of Justin Trudeau using heavy handed force against those people, protesters was to, to, to put a chill in, in, in the, in the minds of Canadians, because I, I, we had it ourselves here, Barbara, where we were getting messages from supporters saying, you know, if I donate to true North, will I, I have my bank account frozen? And it's like, exactly. it's like all, all they have to do is plant that seed of doubt in people's minds. And, and conservative groups will take a hit because no one wants to do something that subsequently a month later is deemed to be uh, illegal or something like that, or, or extremist. And then all of a sudden have to live with the repercussions for, for years Listen, to come. People like people like Trudeau think we're in a war and, and what he did was as, as good as put sanctions 
on people who support uh, people like you. Um, and uh, he, if, if the idea is, uh, if you cut off the money, you shut down, you shut down the problem. Um, so he made no bones about it. And, and the number of times that he alluded to people who support the Freedom Convoy or people in the con convoy as Nazis or Nazi adjacent, Nazi this, Nazi that swastikas, when that was such a ridiculously nugatory uh, little sidebar to the whole thing was disgusting to me. It was, um, it was such a calculated, such a calculated uh, um, strategy for branding uh, a segment of the Canadian population as people that uh, you are allowed to hate. Because who's the worst, who are the worst people in the world? Nazis, right? So we can hate Nazis. So you can hate these people. And, and I'm giving my blessing to that. He is a horrible prime minister in that respect. He is the most divisive prime minister we've ever had. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the message that, that, that too many people have taken is, uh, oh, I'll, 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 I'll be good. Don't worry. I won't be one of the people that you're going to call a Nazi or an adjacent Nazi or marching with Nazis. No, 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 I don't. I'll, I, I'm better than that. I'm a good Canadian. I'm, you know. Well, and I, and I think that's right. Like so many, I mean, my own grandparents and people in my family went to fight against Nazis in World War II. So the whole idea that somehow people standing up for basic freedoms today have anything to do with that ideology is, is so, to me, it's so, it's so untrue, Barbara, that I couldn't even take it seriously. Like when he said it, I laughed and I'm like, really, he's going to try with this. Like, I think even members of his adoring legacy media thought that he sort of jumped the shark with that one. But then I, I you know, I, re I read a lot online and I read message boards and stuff. It's like, you know, the, the, there, there was something that stuck about that because the media for, for five years has been pushing this idea that the conservatives and the right are kind of flirting with the far right and the extreme right. And that means racial nationalism or something like that. You know, even though the, the, the people that they accuse of doing that, it's patently true that they don't do that. Uh, but, they'll, you know, they'll find one example of one thing that someone said and, and kind of use that to paint the entire group. And it, I mean, it's the, it's the same kind of problem uh, as, as this bill with sort of the chilling of speech, the saying that certain things are not acceptable to talk about in our society and that certain people are just beyond the pale and, and they can't. Well, I mean, he said things, things that I, I like, seriously, if if they were said by Donald Trump, like, how long will we tolerate these people? This is unacceptable. Yeah, that was about the anti pe people who don't want to get vaccinated. He called them racist and said that we should hold. Yeah, it. like they're they're they these people are you know this idea that uh, uh, they're unhygienic. They're unhygienic. They are, uh, and I'm not. I I in fact I've written that we can't keep calling anybody a Nazi. That you know, but but certainly uh, one way of 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 segregating a portion of the population is to insinuate, to imply that their ideas, their ways, their behavior are a form of, um, uh, that they are bringing a certain germ into the purity of the public forum. You know, we the good people in this country are all getting vaccinated because we believe in moral hygiene, and physical hygiene, like it's it's a form of hygiene. Uh, so you want to paint people as bad, you paint them as a form of dirt in some way. They're bringing dirt into the house, into the and I, I I didn't I didn't laugh at him with all that talk. I didn't laugh at all because I could see it for the tactic that it was. I could even imagine him sort of discussing it with some of his, you know. Uh, the people with whom he discusses things to to uh, decide how he's going to uh, frame an issue. I, I um, he's not as he's not a stupid man, um, and he's very determined to. Uh, he's got his legacy, his vision of of what he wants to. He wants to change this country um, along, you know, to to meet his own. Uh, dreams and expectations. And um, I have to say, uh, a lot of Canadians are, are allowing him 
you know, they're supporting him and we've, we've got him for so long because we've deserved him as a collective. We've kept him in power. Um, it's well, that's, that's, that's democracy, right? <laughs> Yeah, you, you know, they always say you get the government that you deserve. Well, ho hopefully with a conservative leadership race on the horizon, uh, something new will get offered and Canadians can have a real meaningful choice uh, in the next election. Let us hope. Okay, Barbara. Well, I really appreciate your insight on Bill 67. I, I think that there's something to uh, what you have done because uh, Jordan Peterson and yourself came out really against this bill and it seems to be stalled i know i know it's it's over in committee it passed first reading and second reading and then and then that's when you guys started covering it and now it's sort of stalled so maybe the government will quietly make this bill go away because of uh, the the uh, you know raising of the alarm that, that you have done so uh, we appreciate that and we appreciate uh, your time uh, and coming on true north today absolutely my pleasure uh great to be with you candace and all right thank you so much that's barbara k i'm candace malcolm and this is the candace malcolm show